So what happens, when you inherit millions upon millions, and are left to your own devices? What happens, when you inherit a huge fortune, and are seen by most, as a means to an end? Well, today we are going to find out. Welcome to Schmancy, the place where we talk all things rich, exclusive, and fancy Schmancy. Today, we're taking a look at the daughters of some of the wealthiest and most influential families of yesteryear. These are the women who were not only made of money, but those whose stories sometimes included public scrutiny, drama, and of course, we can't forget the leeches. Otherwise known as the poor little rich girl, and surrounded by glamour and luxury, they appeared to have it all. But is all that glitters truly gold? So come along with us, as we introduce you to each lady's successor, and reveal to you just how they spent their inheritance, as well as the circumstances the great fortune brought into their lives. Without further delay, here are the top 10 most unforgettable heiresses. Number 1. Jenny Jerome. Born in 1854 in Brooklyn, New York, Jenny Jerome was one of the first of the American dollar princesses to cross the ocean and marry into the European aristocracy. Born into a wealthy family of financiers as Jeanette Jerome, she grew up both in New York and Paris. In 1873, while attending an event on the Isle of Wight, she met Lord Randolph Churchill, son of the 7th Duke of Marlborough, and within three days, they were engaged. They married in 1874 at the British Embassy in Paris, and from then on she was known as Lady Randolph Churchill. Less than eight months after marrying, she gave birth to their first child Winston Churchill, who grew up to become a famous British Prime Minister. Exuding beauty, charm, and wit, Lady Randolph Churchill quickly became a glamorous figure in British society. Though married, she was known to entertain many lovers. Perhaps it was an open marriage, because both she and her husband kept very active sex lives outside their marriage. Sadly, Lord Randolph ended up dying at age 45, due to complications from syphilis. Lady Randolph remarried twice after his death. Her second husband was a British officer just a few days older than her own son Winston and her third, another British officer, only three years younger than Winston. Lady Randolph Churchill died in 1921 of complications from an amputated leg, after falling down the stairs in her brand new heels. She is buried next to her first husband in the Churchill family plot in Oxfordshire. Number 2. Consuelo Vanderbilt. Another dollar princess. This one fresh out of the Vanderbilt family. Born in 1877 in Manhattan, New York, Consuelo was the only daughter and the eldest child of William and Alva Vanderbilt. Largely dominated by her mother, in 1895 she was forced into marrying Charles Spencer Churchill, the 9th Duke of Marlborough. Being recently divorced and ostracized by American society, her mother Alva saw her daughter's marriage as a most strategic move to remedy and elevate her own social status. But being secretly engaged to an American at the time, Consuelo had no interest in marrying anyone else, let alone the Duke of Marlborough. After thwarting Consuelo's elopement, her mother locked her up in her room and threatened to murder her fiancé. Consuelo would eventually acquiesce to marrying the Duke, only after Alva feigned illness and claimed to be at death's door due to Consuelo's stubbornness. Shortly thereafter, her mother made a miraculous recovery from her phantom illness. But it didn't keep Consuelo from weeping inconsolably behind her veil, during her marriage ceremony. The Duke received a hefty $2.5 million dowry from the Vanderbilts, and Consuelo became the Duchess of Marlborough. The couple had two sons, the first who became the 10th Duke of Marlborough, the second whose father was questionable due to Consuelo's multiple brazen affairs throughout her marriage. The divorce came after 26 unhappy years, with Alva admitting she had forced her daughter into marrying the Duke. Immediately after her divorce, Consuelo married Jacques Boulson, a French aviator. And this time around, it was for happily ever after. She died in 1964, and is buried at the Churchill family plot in Oxfordshire. Number 3. Huguette Clark. Born in 1906, she was the youngest daughter of Copper Baron and U.S. Senator William A. Clark, the same guy who built this monstrosity of a mansion on Manhattan's Fifth Avenue. After inheriting her father's money and mansion, Huguette sold the mansion off to developers and moved into a lavish 42-room Fifth Avenue apartment, occupying two floors, and overlooking Central Park. But despite her privileged background, she was never your typical socialite. After a brief two-year marriage, she embarked on a remarkably private existence, immersing herself in art and amassing a huge collection of toys and dolls. She is also known for owning multiple mansions, particularly Bellosgado in Santa Barbara, and the French Chateau in New Canaan, Connecticut. These were properties she kept meticulously with a dedicated staff, but never visited for over 60 years. As she aged, she became even more of a recluse and even more eccentric. 
In 1991, after receiving cancer treatment at a nearby New York hospital, Huguette decided she would be perfectly happy living at the hospital. Though she had made a full recovery, for the last 20 years of her life, she paid a monthly rent of $26,000 just to live at the hospital. There she made generous multi-million dollar donations to her favorite nurse, hospital workers, friends, and even strangers. Huguette Clark died at her hospital home in 2011, only two weeks short of her 105th birthday. Of course a total of 19 distant family members came out of the woodwork to contest her will, particularly those whom she had never met. Interestingly enough, they received a sum of $34.5 million from the settlement. The remainder of her $300 million estate went to the arts, including a new foundation created for the care of her Santa Barbara property, which may someday turn into a museum. Number 4. Marjorie Merriweather Post. Born into humble circumstances in 1887 in Springfield, Illinois, she was the only child of Ella Merriweather Post and Charles William Post, founder of the Post Serial Empire. Growing up, Marjorie watched her father turn his business from a small beverage company into a massive multi-million dollar cereal company. Tragedy struck in 1914, when her father took his own life. As the sole heir, Marjorie inherited the entirety of her father's $20 million cereal fortune, turning her into one of America's wealthiest women at age 27. Embracing her father's entrepreneurial spirit, she fearlessly jumped on board as director of the company and grew to become one of America's most successful businesswomen. Her second husband, stockbroker E.F. Hutton, would join her in 1920 as president of the company. Together, they set out to buy the competition. And within a few years they acquired brands like Jell-O, Maxwell House, Sanka, and Bird's Eye Frozen Foods, eventually renaming the company to General Foods, and becoming one of the largest food corporations in America. Marjorie is also well known for her lavish lifestyle, for rubbing shoulders with political elites, and for two of her most popular estates, Hillwood and Mar-a-Lago. Located in Washington, D.C., Hillwood Estates is now a museum showcasing her extensive French and Russian art collection. Mar-a-Lago was her Palm Beach winter retreat. Today, it's a private Trump resort. Marjorie died in 1973, and the bulk of her estate went to her three daughters. Number 5. Barbara Hutton. Born in New York City in 1912, as the granddaughter of retail tycoon Frank W. Woolworth, Barbara Hutton would end up with a third of her grandfather's estate. Her mother was Edna Woolworth. Her father Franklin Hutton, E.F. Hutton's brother and co-founder of the E.F. Hutton brokerage firm. For a time, she was actually Marjorie Merriweather Post's niece. When her mother took her own life in 1917, four-year-old Barbara was the one to discover her body. Regardless of the traumatic experience, she inherited a $2.1 million trust from her mother's estate, and another at $26 million, when her grandmother died in 1924. By her 21st birthday, both trusts which were administered by her stockbroker father, had increased to a total of $50 million, making her one of the richest women in the world. Though Barbara's father was shrewd with her money, as a child, he was extremely cold towards her. She had spent the bulk of her childhood with governesses, at boarding schools, and bouncing around with various relatives. Plagued by a lonely childhood, her mother's death, and a terrible weakness for foreign broke aristocratic men, Barbara married seven times with each husband walking away with a nice chunk of her fortune. The only husband who took nothing from her was actor Cary Grant, as he had his own money, and had always remained a true friend. Her disdain for prenups, extravagant spending, a corrupt lawyer, and a drug and alcohol addiction, eventually led her into financial ruin. She spent her final years living in seclusion at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. By the time she died in 1979, she only had $3,500 in the bank, Number 6. Doris Duke. As the only child of tobacco and energy magnate James Buchanan Duke, hers is another story that's filled with lurkers and leeches. Born in New York in 1912, within a week of Barbara Hutton's birthday, the two heiresses spent much of their lives being compared by the press, and in competition with each other. In 1925, at 13 years old, she inherited a $70 million fortune upon her father's death, making her one of the nation's richest little girls. But unlike other heiresses, Doris Duke only married twice. Her second marriage was to Porfirio Ruberosa, an international playboy who eventually moved on to marry her rival, Barbara Hutton. Though Doris had a prenup, he was able to siphon millions from her in fine marital gifts, as well as a house in their divorce settlement. That second divorce was enough for her to realize that men would only love her for her money. After that, she chose to never marry again. Plagued by loneliness, in 1988, she adopted a 35-year-old stranger as her daughter. Needless to say that didn't end well either. 
Before disinheriting her, Doris had bought her a house, together with some other fancy gifts. This same adoptive daughter would later sue her estate and win $65 million. In her final years, Doris became a recluse, living in a house of only servants and healthcare professionals, and not a friend or family in sight. Though she was conned a few times, thankfully she had a great team of advisors. In 1993, Doris Duke died in Los Angeles, leaving an estate worth $2.5 billion to charitable foundations. Oddly enough, she named her butler as executor of her estate. Of course no one bought it. After a two-year litigation, where it was determined he was up to no good, he lost his seat as executor, and died shortly after. But not before he made out with a $2.5 million mansion in Bel Air, and a few million dollars, all of which he got to keep. Number 7. Gloria Vanderbilt. Born in New York in 1924, into one of the wealthiest families in America, she had her share of drama cut out for her at only 18 months, when her father Reginald Claypool Vanderbilt passed away. He left her a $2.5 million trust fund, making her one of America's richest babies at the time. Gloria's mother on the other hand, only received control over her daughter's inheritance, forcing her to become financially dependent on her own daughter's trust fund. As a young pleasure seeker, her mother would abandon her, as she partied for months on end with European royals and aristocrats, on the Vanderbilt dime. By the time Gloria had turned nine, her aunt Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, would hear no more of it. The custody battle that ensued became a sensationalized media spectacle, with her mother's allowance being drastically reduced, and Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney eventually winning custody of Gloria. When Gloria came of age in 1942, she took control of her own trust fund, and cut her mother off entirely. Though she had inherited wealth, in the 1970s, Gloria used her name and fame to create a luxury fashion brand, introducing a line of designer jeans and a collection of perfumes in the 80s. She married four times, with two sons from her second marriage, and two sons from her fourth. Tragedy struck in 1978, when her fourth husband died during open-heart surgery at the age of 50, and again in 1987 when she watched her son Carter jump to his death from their 14th floor Manhattan apartment. Gloria died in 2019, and is survived by her three sons, one of which is Anderson Cooper. It is stated that upon her death her estate was only worth $1.5 million. Number 8. Sonny Von Bulow. Born in 1932 in Manassas, Virginia, she was the only child of utilities magnate George Crawford. At the age of three, upon her father's death, she inherited $100 million. Like Barbara Hutton, she too was a magnet for broke aristocrats. Her first marriage was in 1957 to Prince Alfred von Auersberg of Austria. She met him at a Swiss resort. He was her tennis instructor. They had two children, a prince and a princess. Sadly, it wasn't happily ever after, and they divorced in 1965. A year later in 1966, she married Klaus von Bülow, a British lawyer and descendant of Danish nobility. They had one daughter, but by 1980, divorce was again on the horizon. That same year, when Sonny slipped into a coma at her Newport mansion, it wasn't long before her two eldest children, suspected Klaus of foul play. He was charged with attempted murder, by over-injecting his hypoglycemic wife with sedatives, and insulin. His motive, a $14 million inheritance to gain from her will. After two sensational trials, and hiring Alan Dershowitz for his appeal, he was acquitted. Though Sonny's family remained convinced that Klaus was guilty, her youngest daughter believed her father was innocent. As a result of siding with him, she was disinherited from her grandmother's fortune. In a civil suit brought against Klaus by the family, he was forced to divorce Sonny, give up all claims to her fortune, and leave the United States. It was only then, that her youngest daughter was reinstated in her grandmother's will. Sonny von Bülow, however, never woke up from her coma. For 28 years, she remained in a persistent vegetative state, until her death in 2008. Number 9. Christina Onassis. Born in New York in 1950, she was daughter to two incredibly wealthy parents, shipping magnate Aristotle Onassis, and shipping heiress Athena Lovanos. In 1968, eight years after her parents' divorce, her father married former First Lady Jackie Kennedy. A woman who Christina never quite liked. She always felt Jackie Kennedy was after her father's money. Meanwhile, her biological mother Athena became even wealthier, by marrying her father's rival, shipping billionaire, Stavros Niarchos. Raised mainly by nannies and boarding schools, Christina spent much of her life living in absolute luxury, while endlessly searching for love and fulfillment. It's too bad that she never found them. She married four times within a 16-year period, welcoming a daughter in her fourth marriage. 
Unfortunately, her cheating husbands had a hard time keeping their mistresses under wraps, leaving her with no choice but to divorce them. Tragedy struck in 1973, when her brother died in a plane crash. It struck again in 1974, when her mother died of a drug overdose. It struck once more in 1975, when her father died of a terminal illness, leaving Christina all alone, as the sole heir of both her mother and father's estate, totaling $600 million. And just as Christina had suspected, her father's widow came looking for a fat cut, even though he did not leave her a large sum in his will. After two years of litigation, Jackie O accepted a settlement of $26 million from Christina, in waiver of all the other claims she had on the Onassis estate. Sadly, Christina did not live too long past her family's death. After four broken marriages, inconsolable grief, battles with depression, and an addiction to prescription drugs, she died of a heart attack in 1988. She was only 37 years old. By then her estate was only worth $250 million, which she left to her three-year-old daughter, Athena. And just when you thought you had heard it all, we have for you our final heiress. Patty Hearst. More like, the case of Patty Hearst. A notable chapter in FBI history. Born in San Francisco in 1954, she is the granddaughter of publishing magnate, William Randolph Hearst. In 1974, while attending Berkeley at the age of 19, she was abducted from her apartment by the SLA, a far-left revolutionary group. They knew her wealthy and influential family would bring them tons of money and media attention. And so at first, they demanded a $400 million ransom, to be used to feed the poor. They also used her as a bargaining chip, to free some of their members from prison. When nothing went as planned, they resorted to turning Patty Hearst into a member of their extremist group, through daily brainwashing, threats, isolation, and rape. Within weeks, the wealthy heiress had taken up their cause. She was regurgitating their radical gibberish, building explosive devices, shooting with automatics, robbing banks, even extorting money from her own father. She basically had a truly terrible case of Stockholm Syndrome. After more than 19 months with the SLA, Patty was finally captured by the FBI. In 1976, she was convicted of bank robbery and sentenced to seven years in prison. Only two of those years were served, as President Carter had commuted her prison term in 1979. She remained on probation indefinitely until 2001, when she was pardoned by President Clinton. Hers is a case of the complexities of the human mind, and how it can so easily bend, when under severe pressure. Shortly after her release from prison, Patty Hearst married one of the policemen who was part of her security detail. They had two daughters. As our only living heiress, Patty is no longer in the limelight, and currently lives a very low-key life. And that's it for our 10 most unforgettable heiresses. So which of these ladies fascinated you the most? Are there any others that you feel should have made this list? Anyway, if there's anything else you would like to mention about this topic, feel free to share it with us in the comments below. Furthermore, if you got any value out of this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and click on the bell icon, so you never miss out on another video. With that said, we'd like to thank you for watching, and we'll see each other next time.